Hello there, friends. We're back. This is week five of our Lady Berean Bible study. And last night we were in John chapter two, verses 12 through 25. So what I'm going to ask you to do is pause the video right now and open up your Bibles and read those verses. After this, he went down to Capernaum. What is after this? Well, it's after the wedding. They had just been to this wonderful time of a bride and groom committing their lives to each other. And there was so much festivity and happiness and joy. And then Jesus turned the water into wine and things were good. Okay, so that's all over now. And it's just a little while later now they are coming into Capernaum in verse 12. And it says he uh, went down to Capernaum, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they all did not stay there many days. So the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. All right, first I have to say that Capernaum had become Jesus' um, home base, so to speak, headquarters, all right? There was a trade route going through there, and it was an ideal place for the word to spread and for people to find out that the Messiah had come. And something else about Capernaum is that that is where Matthew, the tax collector, was called. Just a little uh, side piece of information there. So if we look into verse 13, it says, Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Well, if you look at a map, you'll see that Jerusalem is not up. Jerusalem is south of Capernaum. So why did John use the word up? Well, he used it because in elevation, uh, Jerusalem is higher. And so that's why he could say they went up to Jerusalem. J. Vernon McGee, he's one of my favorite commentators. He said that this happened around the month of April. And how do we know that? Because it was the Passover. It was the Lord's Passover. However, notice here that uh, in, in this verse, John calls it the Jews' Passover. He's changed the name. Now, if you've ever been to a Passover feast, you know what I'm talking about. It's where the Jews recount uh, what happened as God drew them out of Egypt. And so they recount the whole thing with the 10 plagues and, and all of that. And it's, it's just a delightful meal of symbolism about really the Lord Jesus Christ coming, the Messiah that was to come. And so John has changed the name here from the Lord's Passover to the Jews' Passover. It was now merely a religious feast, a meaningless ritual. And do you know why? Because Jesus, the one of which the Passover speaks, has now come cleansing the temple. And this is the beginning of his ministry. So it's also going to happen again later, three years later, at the end of his ministry. So verse 14, let's look at that. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and money changers doing business. Jesus was angry. Not only that they were doing this in the first place, but he was angry because of the dishonesty uh, the greedy practices that were going on, and he particularly disliked their presence on temple grounds. All right, they were making a mockery of God's house of worship. The Jews would not accept any kind of money except temple money. So they were making a pretty good profit here by making the exchange. They all had to pay the temple tax, which was the equivalent of about two days' wages for a working man. But it had to be paid in the special temple coin. Let's look at verse 15. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said, I'm in verse 16 now. He said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. So what was happening was it was being misused by people turning it into a place of profit. And this is how we can apply it to ourselves. If we see church as a place to advance our business, that's wrong. 
when we attend church, it should be only to worship God. So, and we talked about that, how some companies are um, encouraging their people to go join a church and go join a club and do all these things so you can get in and make friends and then make money off of them. And so um, that that is a dishonest approach. And it is not what church is all about. We go to church because we love Jesus and we want to worship him and we want to be with his people. Okay, so Jesus is clearly quite upset here. I mean, he's turning tables over and he's angry. And you know what? That's okay. It is okay. There is a place for anger. The difference, though, between uncontrolled rage and righteous indignation is quite significant. Yet, they're both called anger, aren't they? So we must be very careful about how we use that powerful emotion of anger. It is right for us to be angry about injustice and about sin and about the abominable behavior in front of of our faces that's going on in our nation right now, who wouldn't be angry? But it is wrong to be angry over trivial personal offenses, all right? I always ask myself, is this going to matter 100 years from now? Some of these things we see happening are going to matter 100 years from now, but a lot of our little personal trivial uh, offenses, no, they're not going to make a difference. So, um, control your anger. We spent a little bit of time talking about that last night, about how damaging it can be. So Jesus did not drive those doing business out of the temple courts in a flash of anger. It might appear that way, but as we look at it a little closer, we see that he carefully took the time to sit down. You know, he was probably watching all this going on, and he he sat there and he's working on creating and fashioning a whip. He was clearly thinking very, very carefully about what he was going to do. The sense here is much more a display of Jesus' authority than it is violence. So what we learned as we dug a little deeper is that this kind of authority is granted to some, but not all. God does not call us to be vigilantes, all right? He says, let vengeance be mine. And that's in Deuteronomy 32, 35. So like the government gives police officers authority over us and the authority to use force if they have to at times, um, Jesus had God's authority. He had his father's authority. And we should never try to claim his authority where it has not been given to us. So let's look at verse 17. 17 says, Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. Oh, can you imagine as the disciples are watching this, they must have known their Old Testament really well. And they're sitting there watching his zeal for the temple, Jesus' zeal for the temple, and they're going, oh, that's happened. That's happening right now. His disciples remembered. They, they saw this happening before their eyes. It's kind of like we see things happening before our eyes, too, have, that have been prophesied thousands of years ago, and we're seeing them come to fruition right now. And it is exciting when you see that. And so I don't know what kind of, you know, conversation they had between them, but they had to surely have been excited like, this is prophecy. It said this in Psalms. So the verse is Psalm 69, 9, if you want to look it up. So anyway, uh, verse 18 and 20 go on to say, so the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? Oh, they were so pious and so holier than thou and looking down their nose at their very creator. So, and then it goes on, verse 19 says, Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. <laughs> They're going, what is he talking about? And they said, then uh, the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? Like, who do you think you are? They understood Jesus to mean the temple, 
that they were standing in. The temple that Zerubbabel had built over 500 years earlier. And then Herod the Great, he had been remodeling it, making it larger and more beautiful. And it's been 46 years of this because the remodeling started in 20 BC and they were still not finished. And they understood Jesus's words to mean that this imposing building could be torn down and rebuilt in three days. And they were incensed. Ladies, we have to understand that we no longer have a temple where we worship God. Do you know where our temple is? It's right here. It's our body. This is where the Holy Spirit lives and, and moves among us. We looked into Matthew 12, 6 and 8, where um, it, said Jesus, it says that Jesus is greater than the temple. And then verse 8 of Matthew 12 says that he was the son of man. And do you know that everywhere you see son of man, uh, it means Messiah. And do you know that Jesus mentions being the son of man more than he mentions being the son of God in all of the gospels? Isn't that interesting? Um, and the, the uh, disciples would come to know later and understand that he was talking about his own resurrection. Um, you know, and that must have just seemed so puzzling. We really tried hard last night to get into their heads, you know, like, how are they comprehending all of this? And they really, they didn't, but they believed Jesus. And the only way I could liken it to was, um, would be to say, like, my husband is a mechanic and he knows all about cars and all about their inner workings. And sometimes something will happen with one of our cars and he'll just, you know, go into this eloquent explanation using all the terms and telling me all about what's wrong with the car and what he needs to do to fix it. And I just sit there and nod and I don't comprehend a word he's saying. He might as well be speaking another language. And, um, but you know what? I, I don't understand, but I believe him. I believe him because I know that he's good at what he does and I trust him. And I feel like that's kind of how it must have been with the disciples. It's like, well, I don't get any of this, but uh, okay, Lord. <laughs> so Jesus's resurrection, you guys, became the strongest proof for his claims to be God. If you look at this Bible, you'll see these red letters. And these red letters are words that Jesus himself had spoken. And if somebody says something and they die and they're buried and they come back up out of that grave, you better believe that I, I am going to believe every single word that that person said. Another thing is that when he died, if you look in Matthew 27, verses 50 through 54, you'll see what happened. It wasn't even that he he arose, which is huge, and that's that's what we hang our whole um, salvation on for eternity is the fact that Jesus arose. But look at what happened when he died. Read Matthew. If you want to pause for just a minute, turn your Bibles to page or page Matthew 27, 50 through 54. The earth shook. And the bodies came up out of the graves and they walked around and people saw them. And the curtain was torn from top to bottom. I mean, this is huge. That alone told, as you're reading, the centurion said this indeed was the son of God. Just because he saw all of that happening right after Jesus said it is finished. So in verse 21 and 22, it's clear that Jesus is not talking about the temple made of stones, but he's talking about his own body. Raise it up, he says. He's going to raise it up. The word there used in the Greek is E-G-E-I-R-O. Raise it up. Everywhere you see that word in the Greek, it refers to the awakening from the dead, okay? Okay. So in Paul's preaching, it refers to the resurrection of Christ, and it refers to the resurrection of believers. Also, that's us, the followers of Jesus. 
the word is also used in reference to Lazarus when he was raised from the dead. So that is a pretty significant word. I think that's exciting. This is what he meant when he spoke of the temple. It was not until after his resurrection, though, that his disciples actually understood what he meant. And then when you look at verses 23 through 25, you see that they merely nodded. These people where it says uh, they believed in his name after they when they saw the signs which he did okay they were merely nodding in head knowledge when they saw those miracles and you know what james 219 has to say about that you say you believe you do well but even the demons believe and tremble so let's look at 24 and 25 but jesus did not commit to them they committed to him Oh, well, they said they did, but he did not commit to them because he knew what was in man. All right. These people who, quote, believed merely had intellectual assent. They believed in Jesus, but Jesus did not believe in them. Their faith was not saving faith, and there is no greater tragedy, I've said it before, than to miss heaven by 18 inches, the difference from the head to the heart. It says in Romans 10, 9, and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He knew what was in their hearts. He knew their belief was not genuine. Jesus knew all about the human heart. And if you need a, a reminder, I would encourage you to turn to Jeremiah 17, 9 and Isaiah 64, 6. Um, and they both talk about how our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked and that all of our righteousness is like filthy rags. Jesus knew that about them. And when many came to believe on him, he did not, it says he did not commit himself to them. It's because he knew what was going on in their hearts. He And the neat thing about our Lord when he was walking this earth, you guys, is that he was not dependent upon man's approval. Are we dependent upon man's approval? How much does that mean to us? How badly do we desire popular opinion? You know what? Jesus had no interest in either, and he was not flattered in the least by their belief. If belief is nothing more than admiration for the spectacular, it will create applause. That's true. But the Son of God cannot commit himself to that kind of faith. That is not what faith in Christ is all about. It is a superficial faith. It's better than no faith at all, I guess, but it's not enough. It is not enough to save us. Yet, this is the cool thing. Even though he understood what was in the hearts of all humanity, Jesus still loved them. And Jesus still, even though he knows what's in our hearts, he still loves us. He knew and he knows the worst. He knows the worst about all of us. Yet, he also sees the image of God stamped on each and every one of us, even though we are fallen men and women. So when Nicodemus came to him at night, here in the following chapter, in chapter 3, we didn't go that far. That'll be next week. But Jesus did commit himself to Nicodemus because this man's faith was genuine. And we're going to read about that next week. Jesus knew that the faith of some followers was superficial. Some of them actually would be screaming out three years later, crucify him, crucify him. Some of those same people that we just read about are mentioned again in Matthew 27, verses 21 through 24. So it's easy to believe when it's exciting and when everyone else believes the same way. But keep your faith firm 
even when it is not popular to follow Jesus. And we're coming into a time such as that. I was driving down the road the other day listening on the radio, the car radio, to a station I love. It's Moody Radio. And in not too recent history, it was popular to be a Christian. I remember growing up, it was. Everyone claimed to be a Christian. I didn't even know what a real Christian was. But I thought I was probably a Christian. I was an American. So, you know, um, and it was thought to be synonymous with being an American, at least for me and for a lot of people. Um, but this guy on the radio was saying that there, this, there's a chasm that is developing and it's growing wider and wider. Christians used to blend in with unbelievers, but not anymore. And isn't that the truth? True believers, you guys, stand out. They are peculiar people. Um, you can read about that in 1 Peter 2, 9. And Peter's not saying that Christians are odd or weird, you know, even though the world looks at us that way. The passage is communicating that followers of Jesus are his own possession. We are his own special people called and set, set apart because we do believe. We are different from the world around us. We can't help it because we are being transformed by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. No, we do not blend in. I don't want to blend in. Do you? We stand out. They are calling us evil. And as it says in Isaiah 5, verses 20 and 21, woe to him who calls evil good and good evil. So, you know what? We encouraged each other with these words. Yes, we are indeed a peculiar people. And we are okay with that, whatever it brings our way. And we prayed for one another. We had a beautiful time of worship afterwards. Um, we sensed the Holy Spirit just loving on us, filling this room with his presence. And there was much prayer and much uh, love just filling the room where we all sat and what a privilege and pleasure it is to be able to do that here in America. We can still gather like that. We haven't lost all of our freedoms yet. And we are so grateful. So you guys go out there this week. Be different. Stand out. Don't blend in. Have some good conversations with some people. And we'll see you next week. All right. Be blessed. Bye-bye.